Amen. Good afternoon, my friends. It's so good to see everybody, the ones that are here in the sanctuary and the ones that are joining us online. Welcome. We're glad you're here and glad that there are those that will join us. I know that we have a few folks that are out today in the sanctuary, but that's okay. They can catch up later. Amen? Catch up later. So we're in our, still in our study on being Pentecostal in belief and practice. I, I may have said last week that we would have around eight lessons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on exactly how many lessons we're going to have. We'll see how well things go. We'll see how much information or how much material that I can share uh, and then we'll just take it from there. If it's, if it's four lessons, and it's four lessons. If it's eight, it's eight, and so on. So last week, we kind of did the introduction to our class and talked, to, talked somewhat about being Pentecostal, but didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of it. Talked more than anything else about just being a sincere, intimate follower of Jesus Christ and having a relationship with Him. That's really where it starts, isn't it? On anything that we do, we want that deep, deep, deep relationship with God, that deep love that He has for us, and we want to feel that in our lives. That's really what motivates It's not about me. Somebody shout amen. It's about Jesus and how much I can get to know Him and understand Him and follow after Him. So real quick, I'll take you to 1 Corinthians 6, read a couple of verses, 19 and 20, and then we'll just dive right in. So 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, and that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Father, again, we thank you so much for this day. What a blessing it is to be here, Father Lord, and just to study your word and to take your concepts and precepts and just apply them to our hearts and lives for today. And Father, again, I just ask that you would just take this time and Father, you use me and anoint me and anoint the ears and the hearts of the people. And Father, let us walk out of this place stronger than we were when we walked in. And again, we give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen. And amen. I spoke a little bit last week about uh, different types of groups, different types. There's, there's a tons of people that call themselves Pentecostals. What does that look like? Well, the Assemblies of God belongs to a, a group that would be called classical Pentecostals. Classical Pentecostals are those that believe in the initial physical evidence of tongues being spoken and that it comes after salvation. Now, there, and, and most of that would be Assemblies of God. Church of God in Christ, uh, Foursquare, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. It would be that kind of group of people. They, we all believe that tongues is the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I was talking with Eric a little bit this last week. There's, there's the charismatic movement that would believe a lot like what we believe, except they would consider the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Any one of those nine displayed would be the initial physical evidence evidence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, we would reject that teaching. We would say it's tongues is, in, is the initial physical evidence, and I'll get to that maybe this week, maybe next week. Uh, but there are also those that believe in oneness teaching, and I'll try to explain that as much as I can. I, I kind of come from some of that. My, I have family that came out of the oneness teaching, oneness Pentecostals. Have you ever heard of this, this phrase, oneness Pentecostal? Uh, basically, the oneness Pentecostals believe that uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all Jesus Christ, and He was manifested. Uh, uh, Jesus was manifested in all three of those, and so there is no distinct separation. Uh, we would believe that there is God the Father, and that He presents Himself in three different personalities: God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Whereas oneness just believe that it's just Jesus. And, and that's all they, they would focus on. And someone might say, well, is that a big deal? Well, it is a big deal to some degree uh, because they believe that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Because you see, you can't speak in, you, if you don't have Jesus, how can you have the Holy Spirit if you don't have Jesus? And if you don't have Jesus, how can you be saved? So if you don't speak in tongues, therefore you're not saved. Uh, we don't believe that way. We believe that you're saved when you ask Jesus Christ to come to your heart and you receive him as your Lord and Savior and you become complete in him. Baptism in the Holy Spirit comes after that. It could happen immediately after that, but salvation comes first. 
And so don't be confused by a lot of these terms and, and organizations. If you come across one that you have some questions about, ask me or talk to me about it and I'll help you if I can. I remember, it seems like an eternity now, but I remember years ago taking the test to receive Christian Worker Certificate. They don't even have Christian Worker Certificate anymore. It's, it's called something else. But I remember taking the test for it uh, with the Assemblies of God. I was just a young man. And the pastor that was giving the test looked me in the eye and several of the other guys that were going to take it. And he said, ask this question. He said, how much of the Holy Spirit do you receive at salvation? And we must have all looked like dead fish looking at him because we're all sitting there going, looking at him, you know. And in the back of my head, I was going, is that a trick question? Do we get half of the Holy Spirit? Do we get three-fourths of the Holy Spirit? You know, what, what happens at salvation? And after a second or two of letting us sit in there with our wheels spinning, he said, you get it all. You get the, all the, everything of the Holy Spirit at salvation. You can't divide God. Somebody shout amen. Can't divide him or separate him. You get all of God at salvation. So when I was a pastor at Oakville, though, I met a lady who came to see me, and she said, I don't have the Holy Spirit. And I said, well, why would you say that you don't have the Holy Spirit? And she, was, she said to me, the previous pastor here said that if I didn't speak in tongues, I didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a group that kind of believes this. Even some of those from the Assemblies of God. I have met people that would say that if you don't speak in tongues, you've not received the Holy Spirit. The, the problem that you have with that is that doesn't line up with Scripture at all. Okay. Uh, and the other problem that you have with that is how can one be saved without the Holy Spirit? You know, we'll, we'll look at this in just a minute. But there are those that are in our grouping, that are in our church, that, that are around that say, yeah, I don't, I don't believe you have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. Now, they're not oneness. They're not oneness people. They just believe that that's the, the, the mystery of the God. They'll call it the mystery of the gospel. See, the mystery of the gospel is, is one can be saved, but you don't receive the Holy Spirit till you speak in tongues. This, too, is not accurate, and it's a, it's a false doctrine. After hearing some of these things, <laughs> especially looking at this poor lady looking at me with such sadness in her eyes, thinking that somehow or another she had missed God, I just began to think to myself, no wonder there's so much confusion in the church about this beautiful, wonderful gift that God has given to the church to, to help us, and to empower us, and to give us the ability to be the people He wants us to be. And, and I came to the conclusion that we're just not teaching it well. We're just not teaching it very well if we have that much confusion. We need people to teach it and teach it well. Teach it in a correct manner. So I've kind of taken that on in my walk with God in, in teaching. That when I speak about the, the Holy Spirit, especially about being Pentecostal, I want to make sure I present it in the right way so that people can understand it. And I think it's an important teaching. I think it's one of those teachings that we need to have for our lives. One of the things that I believe has caused so much hurt and confusion over the years has just been a misunderstanding of being Pentecostal and how, why is it important to us. It is time that we seriously take a look at this issue and answer the questions that need to be answered. So I'm going to look today, I'm not sure how, much, how far we'll get, but I'm going to look today in the dual, if you're taking notes, the dual ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's D-U-A-L, if my, if my accent got in the way. The dual ministry of the Holy Spirit. Pastor, don't I receive the Holy Spirit at salvation? And if I do, how is this different from the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Kenneth Hagin once made this statement. I thought it was brilliant. He said, there's a dual working of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer. The new birth and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. My friends, without a doubt, you receive the Holy Spirit when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In fact, without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you can't even know you need a Savior. It is the Holy Spirit that tells us clearly we need a Savior. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins convinces us of our need for righteousness and enjoys us to bring us to a greater maturity in our Lord. In John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, starting with verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. And this is Jesus speaking. For if I do not go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, 
of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I'm going to my Father and you will see me no more, and judgment because the ruler of this world stands condemned. So my personal belief is, is that there's a dual working of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say it real quick here, and then I will go into detail and try to break it down into the nuts and bolts. But there's a dual purpose. There is the, in, and if you want to write this down, you can. There's the indwelling Holy Spirit that one receives at salvation. The indwelling Holy Spirit that one receives at salvation. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the indicator of maturity in the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Then you have another dual, the, the dual purpose of the Holy Spirit is empowerment. Write that down, empowerment. And empowerment comes to help us grow not only closer to the Lord, but to be empowered to go out and share the gospel with Jesus Christ. And we find that, the, that the, the Holy Spirit that helps us there are the gifts of the Holy Spirit found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll dive into those as we go through our lesson. So indwelling, empowerment. Now what I have seen in my lifetime as a young man, okay, is that there will be certain religious groups, certain denominations, that will put tremendous amount of emphasis on the indwelling Holy Spirit, and put little to none on the empowerment. Maybe even deny the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the, They'll believe that there's the fruit of the Holy Spirit that grows one to maturity. And these folks will be very, very strong biblically. biblically and, we, and we want to be that. But they will re reject the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The part that God has given to us to bring us to fulfillment so that we can go forth and see the world touched. However, I've seen groups that really lifted up the empowerment part of the Holy Spirit to the place where it's supreme in all things, and the indwelling Holy Spirit is just barely even noticed. They might talk about it in salvation, but there seems like there's no maturity whatsoever in this group of people. They'll be, they'll be high on the empowerment. They'll be high on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They'll be high on signs and wonders. They'll be high on these things that we need to be doing as far as the Pentecostals are concerned. Very little emphasis on maturity. Who Here's what I'm saying. So you got these two groups. And they're pretty prominent when you look at the world. You can see those very clearly. Who here believes that God would like for that to be one person? The indwelling Holy Spirit and the empowerment Holy Spirit working in tandem agreement to make a mature and empowered individual that can go forth and be the person that God desires them to be to touch the world around them. Can I get an amen? That is the balance. And, and I know there are some in the religious realm that don't like the word balanced. Okay. But who believes we need to have balance when it comes to God's word? A balance that helps us to understand what, what kind of person I should fully be. Now, let us be careful. I've seen some that will take a look and see someone that's being used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they'll say, oh, they must be next to God. They might be. But God is not looking necessarily for the more mature person to use in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's looking for someone who has yielded themselves to say, here I am, use me. So let's not judge a person's spirituality because God uses them in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? I think we've done that too much in the past. We'll see a person who God uses and we'll say, oh, they must be very mature. They must be very spiritual. And in the end, they may not be that at all. They may just still be a baby Christian. They may still just be very young in God, still making a lot of mistakes. Yet they're yielding themselves to the power of the Holy Spirit to be used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's what God is looking for. So what are we, what are we to judge? Not the person. But this, we're to judge the Spirit. We're to judge the, the gifts themselves and see if they're accurate. How can I tell the difference between somebody that's empowered by the Holy Spirit and someone who's in the flesh? I test the Spirit. Is that word accurate? Is that word right? Does that word uh, made confirmed by the Bible, by the Word of God? Does it, does it minister to my spirit in a way that helps me to understand? If it brings confusion, then it's probably not of God. Who hears what I'm saying? And then again, we don't judge the person. And I think we get into this, we get in, stuck in this sometimes as we try to judge the person. Well, that person gave a bad word. Let's slow down. <laughs> you know. what, what are we to test again? The Spirit, the Word, what's happening. If it's not of God, 
We should be able to tell it, and we judge that for what it is. We don't condemn the person that gave it, because but for the grace of God, there we all go. So be careful. Let's be careful what we're judging. We're not judging people. We're judging the Spirit. We're judging what God is doing. And if God's doing a good thing, I, I think it was Eric that I was telling later, uh, Mark, Mark Rutland, my, one of my favorite guys, loves to tell the story of being in a meeting one time where they were discussing, it was a church meeting, and they were discussing carpet. You know, there's nothing more hellish than trying to decide what kind of carpet to get in a church. It brings up the worst in people. You know, it really does. So anyway, he was sitting there talking about, they were talking about carpet for the church, and they were, try, they were discussing colors. And they had boiled it down to two colors, red and blue. When one of the, the uh, precious sisters in the church stood up and said, Thus says the Lord God, red, not blue. Who knows that God doesn't care what color our carpets are? God doesn't care if we have carpet. God doesn't care if we've got chairs. God is concerned about what? The heart, your condition, your salvation, your maturity. Are you growing in Him? But again, let us be careful. Uh, th there would be some that would see what this person did and say, Ooh, th we don't, can't allow any of that to happen in our church, so we just won't have any of that. Just keep quiet. No, what we do is we go talk to sister, and we explain to her gently, kindly, in a, in a gentle spirit, that God doesn't judge things like the color of the carpet. That's your flesh. That's the color you want it to be, you know. Let's look and see what God wants in this walk, all right? Let's not, let's not stop the gifts. Let's not throw that out. Let's correct it in the process. So, there are... The dual ministries of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is promised to all believers for greater empowerment in living a holy life and drawing us closer in relationship to our Lord Jesus Christ. The primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is to give us greater power for witnessing. Primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit to, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is to be a witness of God. Now, one of the secondaries is to draw closer to Him, to understand His Word better, to be able to walk a, a holier life. But the primary reason that we're given the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be a witness of Jesus Christ to the world around us. And we should all be witnesses. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should be a witness of Jesus Christ to the world around you. It's, imp it's important. It's, imp it's paramount. Again, I'm not saying you have to stand on a corner and beat people over the head with the Bible when they come by, okay? I'm not saying that there's not a place for the guy with the bullhorn, all right? There's probably a place for that guy. What I'm saying is, let's live a life of holiness. That's most, most of my life, all I've tried to do is just live a life of holiness. And people come to me and say, something different about you, what is it? And then it gives me what? an opportunity to share my story. It gives me an opportunity to tell what I believe. It gives me an opportunity to, to speak to them. And I've learned over the years that if the guy in front of me is shaking his head and, and, and telling me he doesn't want to believe it, there will be two more on the sides looking at us talk, and those guys might be getting it. So don't judge what's going on here. Let God be the judge of that. Let us just be good about making sure we proclaim our stories. What's my story? I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was broken, but God put me back together again. And I do my very best through the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in His presence and His glory to see the world changed. Would you like to know Him? It can be that simple. Would you like to know Jesus? Do you know Him today? And then don't feel guilty if somebody rejects that. Because our job is not to save people. Our job is to be salt and light. Our job is to proclaim the glory of God. Our job is to be a witness before Him. Who believes if we'll do our job, God will do His? Very clearly. So, another purpose that comes from the baptism of the Holy Spirit will be how the Holy Spirit uses us in the gifts of the Holy Spirit to edify the church and to touch the world. We'll talk about those a little later. As Pentecostals, we must be very careful not to overstate our beliefs in regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I, I find sometimes that we, are, we overstate our belief for the purpose of our study, let me just say that to tell people that they must speak in tongues to be saved as heir. I've already said that, but let me say it again. 
To say that speaking in tongues will bring sanctification into a person's life as a primary result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not sound either. We're not talking about sanctification. Sanctification comes about by studying God's Word and praying and being mature in Him. Then we'll be separate from the world. We'll, be, we'll grow stronger in God. But we have to be careful that somehow or another we look at somebody and judge them that they must be next to God because God uses them is inaccurate. I would also say that I have not witnessed that I have uh, not witnessed this as I have observed the life of other believers. Finally, to tell people that all power and ministry gifts follow the baptism of the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues, can't be supported either. But now listen to me very carefully. Please, listen to me very carefully. Just because one speaks in tongues and is baptized in the Holy Spirit does not mean that God will use them all the time in every gift. We're to pray and ask God for the gifts. And then the Holy Spirit is the distributor of the gifts. And He gives the gifts as He sees necessary to give. I don't own anything. If the, if the gift of healing was mine, if I owned it, and it resided in me all the time, I'd go to the hospital and pray over every sick person and believe they would get well, they would get well. Here's what I'm saying. But what God does is He says, okay, today I'm going to give Judy, right now I'm going to give Judy the gift of healing, and it will flow through her body because it belongs to the Holy Spirit. It will flow through her body as she lays hands on somebody for that moment, and that person will receive healing. Judy may go over to the next person and pray for them, all right? And then the Holy Spirit doesn't give that healing, all right? Because of whatever reason that he has. He's God. He can determine how he wants to move. The healing is not in Judy. Who is the healing in? The healing is in the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit. Judy is the vessel that God will use for that. She doesn't own that. It's not her gift. Whose gift is it? God the Holy Spirit. Do you see how we can get sideways with some of this? Have you seen those abuses over the years where people have come in and say, I have the gift of discernment. Well, maybe, but, but it only comes as the Spirit of God gives it to you for a very specific time and very specific place. Okay, Pastor John, then why does God seem to use the same person all the time in a certain gift? Because they've learned to be receptive to God. And they've learned how to say, here I am, Lord, use me. And the more God uses them in that, the more resistance there is. Others get what? I've had people come to me at the end of a service and said, you know, I had like the first two words of that, of that prophecy. Or I had the first sentence of that word. And I was afraid it was me and not God. And I used to tell people, if, if you're that concerned about it, it's probably, it's, it's probably God. Because if it was you, you'd want to speak it out and get all the glory. But God wants to use you. Just relax and let God use you in that gifting. Who follows what I'm saying? You can, you can ask a question. I'm not sure we'll have time to get to it all, but you can ask a question if you want to. Okay. But I've just observed this in my life, that uh, uh, you, you, not all gifts are going to follow the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the other side of that coin is, and then we in the Pentecostal belief believe that to be used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're going to be used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is a teaching that I learned when I was growing up in the church. But let me just caution everyone here. Did God speak through a donkey? Who believes God can do whatever he wants to because he's God? If there's a situation where there is no one in the room baptized in the Holy Spirit and God wants to speak to somebody, who believes he can use a donkey if he wants to, to speak? But it's not the norm. If there's someone in the room that's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, God will use them to give the word or to give the prophecy or to give the tongue or to give the interpretation or, or to give the word of wisdom or to give the word of knowledge. Who's, who hears what I'm saying there? That's the norm. That's the way it should work. But let's not try to control God. We can't put God in a, I can't put God in a box. I don't want for one minute to tell God he can't do something. <laughs> Look out. <laughs> you know, you'll be in trouble. Hmm. All right. 
So as we start to look at the distinct dual ministries of the Holy Spirit, it's so very important to remember that God never intended there to be any real separation between these, between these distinct ministries. But man, because he refuses to enter into the fullness of what God has for his children, has missed out on the promises of God for that fullness. These dual ministries of the Holy Spirit have always been intended to work together to grow, to empower, and to equip every believer as they devote themselves to the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, I think it would be better for us to understand if we break these dual ministries down and go into them a little deeper now. I've talked a little broader. We'll go down and talk about a little deeper in there. But keeping in mind that God's desire for the Spirit to perform both ministries in your life together. So let me just give you Robert Heidler's uh, definition. I think this is really uh, a good one. It says this. It says, The indwelling Holy Spirit is designed to mature us. So the indwelling Holy Spirit is designed to mature us, causing us to grow in the Lord. The empowering Holy Spirit is designed to equip us, enabling us to serve the Lord. Let me, let me give that definition one more time if you're writing it down. The Spirit's indwelling is designed to mature us, causing us to grow in the Lord. The Spirit's empowering is designed to equip us, enabling us to serve the Lord. So let's start with the indwelling Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit. At the very moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. Jesus is now living within your heart. The problem that most people have is that they will only allow him a corner of their heart to live in. I, I see this all the time. We will only limit God to just a very small portion of who we are. We, we want God, but we're not sure we want all of God. It's Jesus' desire to have your heart to overflowing. There's a precious portion of scripture that says that if we bring our cup to Jesus, he'll fill it to overflowing. The, the, the problem is, is most of us come with a communion cup. God's looking for us to bring a gallon jug. That's what God wants to fill up. But God will, if you bring a communion cup, God will fill it to what? Overflowing. God's going to keep his promise. Whatever you give to him, he will fill it to overflowing. But what are you giving him? What are you surrendering to him? What is it that you're saying to the Lord? Are you hiding something? Or do you have a little portion of your heart that you've got cornered off? You know, and you go, oh, this is all mine and I'm going to keep it to myself. God will work with that. But I'm telling you right now, he wants you. He wants all of you. Not just a portion, not just a, a percentage, but he wants all of you. It's really not as scary as you might think it is. It's really just surrendering to God and saying yes to him. Have you noticed that when a person comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus, they're pretty much the same person externally as they were just minutes before? Have you noticed that? It wasn't, it wasn't a great change physically. Where did the change take place? Internally. <laughs> they're still the same person. Now, they may the, the next time you see them, there might be a drastic change. I, I, we had this young man that, that uh, was at our church at Oakville. He was such a great guy. But he started coming to church and he would wear cut off, he'd wear cut off shorts with flip flops and a cut off t-shirt and a baseball hat. And that's how he came to church. And we were okay with that. Say, come on in. We want you to be here. Be a part of the church. Man, he just got radically saved. I mean, radically transformed. And he comes to me and he goes, I want to be a greeter next week. I went, you know, we want you to be a greeter too, but you probably need to put on some slacks and a shirt. Slacks and a shirt. That's all we're looking for. He goes, got it. The next week he showed up with a three-piece suit. Okay. Something had happened in him. A transformation had taken place in him. You know, the, the thing that had happened internally now started to show itself where? Externally. Now that will happen. But when you first get saved, you're, you're still uh, externally the same person. It's something inside of you that happens. The truth, though, is that a change starts to happen within that's the indwelling Holy Spirit. His ministry is to guide you toward maturity. How does he do this? The first way that the Holy Spirit indwells us is by making the Word of God come alive to us. How many of us have heard people say that the Bible is too hard to understand? 
We've heard, we've had people say it. The Bible's too hard to understand. But the minute they come to Jesus, the minute the transformation starts to take place on the inside, suddenly the gospel comes alive. Now, I, I can't tell you how many times that I've had people say, you know, Pastor, I, I've read that scripture a dozen times, but you know, when I got saved, I read it, and it just became clear as a bell. That is the working of the in, in, uh, indwelling Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 says, But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but He will speak whatever He hears, and He will tell you things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will receive from Me, and will declare it to you. The, the second way that He guides us towards maturity is through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and joy, and peace, and patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, listen. I have heard people say that, uh, that to get the fruit of the Holy Spirit is singular. Fruit is singular, not fruits, but fruit is singular. There are some theologians that believe that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what, do you think? It's love. And those others that are listed are what? Characteristics of love. Take whichever way you want to take it, it's fine with me, you know. As long as we understand that the more we grow in Jesus, what should be produced out of our lives? Love. And all the other characteristics that belong to that, those should become greater and greater and and, and grow in me and become more clear in me. Listen, if, if, you're, if you just got saved and you're getting angrier, more judgmental, more irritable, more frustrated, you're probably not growing the way Christ wants you to grow. Who believes the world will be changed by a wonderful love that can't be broken, but we are bound by cords of great love? The world wants to see that. I promise you, the world is all excited about seeing the love of Jesus. No matter how we might believe, we must see that this fruit of the Spirit is the very nature or the character of Jesus Christ. If the fruit of the Spirit is growing within us, then we are growing in Christ and we are becoming what the Bible calls Christ-like. How many of us have heard that term, to be Christ-like? How do I know I'm becoming Christ-like? Love. Joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Those things become more evident in me. And as they become more evident in me, the more I become Christ-like. Let me just say that the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit growing within us is the only true indication of spiritual growth. Mark that down. The only true indicator of spiritual growth is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The empowerment, do, the, the empowerment characteristic or the empowerment Holy Spirit is not an indicator of spiritual growth. Too many people try to equate the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit as an indicator of spiritual growth, but this is just not true. It is the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit that helps us to mature in Christ. Although we Pentecostals believe that within the baptism in the Holy Spirit comes an overflowing fullness of the Spirit and a deep reverence for God, an intensified consecration to God and a dedication to His work and a more active love for Christ, for His Word and for the lost, the gauge of maturity for the believer is the indwelling Holy Spirit. However, I would just, again, encourage you that we need the empowering Holy Spirit to accomplish the task that God desires for us to accomplish and to help others. So, the first one that we talked about was the Word of God. That's an indicator that helps us. Then we're told that it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit is another way that brings us to maturity. So we have the Word of God. We have the fruit of the Holy Spirit that's bringing us towards maturity. The third way that the Holy Spirit helps us move to maturity is by giving us the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus. And I believe that the way he does this is through the expression of the gifts listed in Romans 12, 3 through 8. 
I'm going to spend just a little bit of time here because we don't hear much about these particular gifts. But these are gifts that are not part of the empowering Holy Spirit, but these gifts are part of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And sometimes people get them confused because they think these are empowering gifts. They're not. They're part of the indwelling gifts. And we'll talk a little bit about them. So if, if, you're, if, you, if you look at Romans 12, 3 through 8, uh, I will try to talk to these to the best I can. The first one that's listed is prophecy. I'll give you some time to write that down. Prophecy. This is not the prophecy that is listed as a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is different. This is a different prophecy. This is not hearing from God and giving that uh, as the word of God. But it is to bring correction within the body when an error is noted. Something is wrong. doesn't have to be supernatural, nor does it have to be discerned. Someone can just look at something and see that it's wrong and need to bring correction. If someone... If you see a child doing something wrong and you don't bring correction, what would most people call that? Neglect. <laughs> Han said it. Neglect. Okay. If you see a child doing something that's inappropriate or wrong, there needs to be correction. Maybe we need a little more of that today. That doesn't have to be something that's supernatural. That doesn't have to be something that's discerned or learned spiritually. It's just a fact. I look, I see, it's wrong, let's correct it. That's what this prophecy is talking about as an indwelling part of the Holy Spirit. The next one that's listed is serving. Serving, again, not as an expression of a supernatural work, but as an expression of the natural ability to serve. Who serves the body? Who serves our body at Angelic Neverhood Church? Don't we all, to some degree, serve the body? You know, if, if, uh, if I pray with you, that's serving. If I take you on an errand someplace, I've done that sometimes. I've had, people, I've had people call me up and say, you know, my TV's not working. And I'm not a very good repairman, but I'll go over and see if I can help them get a TV going. All right? Is that serving? Absolutely. That's serving. If you make a meal for somebody or you take care of somebody or you clean a bandage or you, or, or you uh, see someone that needs babysitting for a while, you go babysit for them. That's serving. You're serving the body. It's part of the maturity that comes. Everybody here should be serving. Okay, let's, let's look at this clearly. Prophecy. You see something wrong? Correct it. You see something wrong? Bring notice to it. Second, we need to be serving. Everyone in the body of Jesus Christ, as they mature, should have more of a heart to what? To serve. To take care of people. To encourage people. To show people that you're growing in God. Listen, I, I'll be honest with you. If, if you're in the body of Christ and you're not serving, you're not helping, you're not encouraging someone, you're not doing something to be a part of the body of Christ... You probably should look yourself in the mirror and ask, what's, what's going on? How come, I'm, how come I don't have a desire to serve? The next one is teaching. A God-given desire to communicate the truth of God in order to give enablement and direction. Now listen to me very carefully. I will get somebody that will come to me and say, I'm not a teacher. This is not talking about someone that teaches as part of the, the ministry gifts in Ephesians 4.11. How many know the, the, the ministry gifts in, in 4.11? It talks about teaching as that gift. That's a, God gives teachers to the body to teach. That's not this. This is that, that kid that's doing something wrong. Okay. You correct the error. What needs to come along with the correcting of the error? Some instruction. On why are you doing what you're doing? This is what you need to do to get better. I, I've worked with a lot of juvenile boys over the years. And I can tell you that part of the process of dealing with juvenile boys that are misbehaving is not just to punish. Too often people want to punish. We're going to punish this, this child for doing wrong. We're going to bring correction to this child who's doing wrong. But if you fail to follow through with the instruction, 
What have they learned? What's happening? You have to teach. You have to. And with a child, a lot of times you have to make them tell you first, what did you do wrong? I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a child. What did you do wrong? I don't know. Mom was just mad at me or daddy's just mad at me. But, you know, they just don't like me. I, I'm the least favorite child of the family. Hmm. Okay. What did you do wrong? <laughs> you know, make them tell you what it is they did wrong. Encourage them to tell you. And then give instruction on how to not do that again. That's part of this, this ministry gift or this gift in Romans chapter 12. It's, a, it's not a supernatural, but it's what? A natural gift that God gives. Some people will be better at it than others. Some will have more patience than others. Can I get an amen? Some will have more patience. Some will be less frustrated. But we are told to be teachers. Encouraging a God-giving motivation to encourage others in Jesus Christ. As we grow in Christ, we should be encouragers. We should be bringing encouragement to one another. Giving. A desire to give in ways to meet the needs of others. Giving, again, is not a supernatural gift. It's a, it's a natural gift to give to someone. When we see someone in need, we give. We bless. Anybody here believe the church needs givers? Leading, the ability to, have, to, to give people a vision of what God wants done and effectively coordinate their efforts to accomplish it. Now, there will be people that will be better leaders than others. But in the absence of some leader, someone has to step up, don't they? You may say, I'm not much of a leader. If you're the, if you're the only person that can do that, then step forward and do what God has called you to do. Be a leader. And then the last one is mercy. The compassion of Jesus expressed through us towards those who are grieving and wounded. You know, let me just tell you, guys, that sometimes just a hug, sometimes just a hand, sometimes just a, a hug will go a long, long ways in helping someone come to an understanding in the fullness of what God has for them. Mercy. Anybody here ever had mercy extended to you? Mercy. I, I love to give this little illustration. and Pastor Dank, I'm going to end today's lesson on this illustration here. I, I love to give this illustration because I think it, it really points to what we need to see. If, if you're driving your car down the road and you suddenly leave the road and strike a telephone pole and the telephone pole falls to the ground, you have actually committed a crime. Because in the state of Washington, if you lose control of your car and you drive it off the road and hit a telephone pole, that's, you broke the law. Okay, So a police officer shows up on the scene. He assesses the situation. And he looks at you and he says, you are required to maintain control of your car and keep it on the road. Since you didn't do that, you're right out of ticket. Okay? Here's the ticket. You must report to court on this date. And you take the ticket and say, okay. But then he turns around and does this. He takes it out of your hand and he tears it up. And he says, however, I'm not going to give you a ticket today. That's mercy. Say it together. Mercy. That's mercy. Let me take it one step further. What if he then turns around and tells you, take your car to the shop, get it repaired, and then send the bill to me. And when they come out and assess the damage to the telephone pole, I'll pick up that tab as well. What do you call that? That's called grace. Somebody say grace. Who wants mercy and grace in their lives? How many of us need to display mercy and grace to others? How many of us need to have a heart that says to, to one another, that's what I need in my life today. That's what, listen, that's what being Pentecostal. You want to know what, what is being Pentecostal? Being Pentecostal is seeing the indwelling Holy Spirit come into my life to such a degree that I mature in Him. And as I mature in Him, His Word comes alive to me. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to produce itself in me. And the gift of the Holy Spirit that are listed in Romans chapter 12 begin to flow in me in such a way, a natural ability, that the church becomes alive. Who believes a church that is empowered, excuse me, that's indwelled by the Holy Spirit is a powerful church? 
one that God can use to see the world change. Who believes we need more and more of our people to be mature in Jesus Christ? What do you call a baby that's not doing well in their maturity or in their growth? It's called failure to thrive. You ask a doctor and he'll tell you, failure to thrive. You think we have Christians in the body of Christ sometimes that might have the same syndrome? Failure to thrive. So just remember that as Pentecostals, I, I want the dual action of the Holy Spirit working in my life. The one we talked about today is the indwelling. Next week we're going to meet, we're going to talk about the empowerment. And we'll go into detail about that. Any questions? Father, Lord God, we love, worship, and praise you. We thank you for this day and for this time. Let your blessings just continue to flow. And we just ask for your precious hand to just help us in this process of learning who we are in Christ Jesus. So again, we just give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for being online. We appreciate you so much. Go in peace until we see you again.